Hi, kids. <laughs> okay. So before I ask for any questions, we have a couple of new people and thank you for your wonderful talks. Um, yeah. There's a, a book of, about United States history written for kids back in the 90s and it's called The Story of Us. So Todd was talking about the story of me. Um, yeah, we have a couple of new people. So I wanted to say something about chanting because it might be that when you walked in the door and you suddenly were doing all this chanting and you might have been saying, what? I thought this was a meditation group. Um, so <laughs> I want to just say something about sort of the function of chanting. Um, so there's two things about it. The first is you walk into some place and you say, I'm going to meditate. And your mind is going like this, you know, your story. Your story is just roiling around whatever it is. It might be as simple as, you know, what, what you're going to eat for lunch or what you just had for breakfast, or it might be as complicated as, you know, politics and, and war and all this kind of stuff. And it, it you know, your, your relationships, your job, whatever it is, you know, all this stuff is running around in your head and you walk and you sit on the cushion and um, you're still doing that. So some kind of practice that's an intermediary between the outside world and the practice world, the sitting practice world, I should say, is very helpful. So you walk in and you're given a task to do and if you're new, it seems a little complicated and weird. What's all of these bows and you have to hold the chanting book a certain way. And what do these words mean and so on and so forth. And you follow the tune. So that really forces your mind to not be focused on its own story. That's the first thing. And the second thing is very important. Our practice is not about self actualization. Our practice is waking up and helping this world. And that means being together with everyone around you. And so you walk into the practice space and you're doing something together with everyone around you. And it's not about your own preferences and it's not about, you know, anything in your personal life. And it's not about anything in anyone's personal life in that space but we are just doing something together. And then when we sit in the cush on the cushion, maybe our personal story doesn't have such a hold on us. So that's a very practical function. I mean, you know, in churches, people sing all the time, you know, right? Um, people do things together in uh, any kind of religious, I guess, except the Quakers, they just sit in silence. But um, most people, they, they, most groups, they have this thing of people coming together, doing some kind of activity together, and it's often music. So that's, that just brings us together. We're even breathing together. You know, when, when you sing, people take a breath the same place in the tune. It's really interesting. You can just hear that pause in the chant and then everyone comes back. So it really brings us together, takes us out of our small self. So that's what I wanted to say. And now I'll ask, are there any questions online? Or, yes, sir. Wait, 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 pass the microphone, hope it works to Austin. <laughs> Did the recording start? Yes, yes. I found it in here, I guess. That was my question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, are there any other questions? Really? I have a question. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so, um, so I, I was reading something and I thought to myself, well, I don't really believe that. And, and it brought me to, to something that I struggle with in um, uh, the practice because, you know, it, on the one hand, is it a practice where you can just pick and choose what you believe, you know, or what you agree with? But it seems that if you do that, you know, you might go down a wrong road. And so where does faith come in? You know, is it, is it that I just, let's, let's take 
uh, assume that the, the thing that I'm reading or listening to is a, a teacher and a teacher in good standing. And so if you, if you don't agree with that, then does that take you down the wrong road? And, but yet if you blindly agree everything, then that doesn't help you either. So it's that thing of, of those, of the teachings. And, and I sometimes feel like I pick and choose what I'm going to believe in and what I'm not going to believe in or agree with. So if you could address that. Yeah. Buddhism is not about belief. It's not about that. And faith does not mean believing something in Buddhism. So there are three sort of legs of the stool in Buddhism. There's um, faith or trust. There's great question or great doubt. And there's great effort, persistence. Those three things we need to practice. And the faith, when I say faith or trust, that means that there's a Chinese word that I'm translating, although I don't know what the Chinese word is, but I'm told there's a Chinese word that, we were trans that we're translating here. And it means simultaneously, it, has, it means faith and it also means trust because it's a word in a different language. So this faith, this trust. So if you think of it as trust, it's trust like when you put your foot down, you trust that the ground will be there for it. And sometimes it's not. You know, sometimes you, it's night and you're walking, you fall into a hole, right? That happens. But it's that sense of this universe is there. And that doesn't mean it's there for me and my life is going to be fantastic. That doesn't mean that. It just means trust that the universe is there. You are part of this universe. But it's not a belief. It's just you put your foot down and the earth is there. So that's that kind of faith. But it's a faith that even when I put it that way, that is not deep enough. Because, yes, yeah, sometimes you put your foot down and there's a hole. But that's this faith, this trust is like that. Okay? And then there's great question or great doubt. So that's very important. So many of us, our practice is focused on great question. What am I? What is this? And sometimes it takes other forms. For a number of years, for me, it took the form mind comes from where, because I'm that kind of person. Okay? So, it, but there's this great question and this attitude of great question infiltrates into all of our lives. So my teacher never said, I don't teach Buddhism, I only teach don't know. So don't know is this open mind. What is this? Who am I? What is this? You know? So you look at everything fresh, like a baby. The baby doesn't know what's going on around it, but it's really interested in everything. What is this, you know? So that mind, that's the great doubt. And then everyone understands what effort, perseverance, what that means. So it's not, do I believe what this person is saying? That's irrelevant. But this person is pointing. Any, anyone who is teaching Buddhism, they're pointing to something. They're pointing to something. And sometimes people point and you think they're saying, well, can I get these? There we go. Sometimes, because I'm looking at the screen and not at my fingers. <laughs> so sometimes people point and it looks like they're pointing the opposite way. But no, they're pointing to the same thing right there. You know? So it's not about ideas. It's not about opinions. It's not about do I believe this thing somebody said. It's that where are they pointing? That's what's important. And yes, yeah, sometimes you disagree with the superficial aspects of what's being said. And sometimes people lose their way and they're pointing in the wrong direction. That happens. You know? So yeah, we don't, we don't take things on, on sort of this 
blind belief system of, oh, this person has this title, and oh, they're so great, oh, I must believe it. That's not how it works. You know, Buddha himself said that you have to examine deeply, examine deeply. Don't take anything because somebody said it, but you have to examine it deeply. Buddha himself said that. He said, don't listen to me, <laughs> you know? Just examine this world deeply, okay? Thank you. Are there any other questions? Wait, stop a second. Can you hear her? Can you hear me? No. Try speaking really loudly. Wow. For the newcomers, could you explain a little bit about Bodhisattva? Okay. Did you all hear that? Okay. 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 So, Bodhisattva. So, um, Bodhi means awake. And what does sattva mean? Yeah, that's what I thought. Being, yeah, awake, awake being. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so a bodhisattva is a person who is not interested as the arhats are. And by the way, you can find lots of, at least one, but I think several arhats in the um, Nelson Museum, which has this amazing, amazing Asian art collection. It's fantastic. Uh, Good question. Okay, so there was another question. A bodhisattva is limited to human beings. We'll get to that. Um, so, first of all, so a bodhisattva is someone who is awake, but their life is not about them. Their life is for all beings. So in our chant, in our morning bell chant, um, we have a, a stanza that basically says, together all beings awake, attain enlightenment. Together, in one moment, all beings wake up. Self, other, it's translated as you and I, but self, other, in one moment, wake up. So a bodhisattva understands that they're not a little discrete being in a little box, and they can wake up and go to nirvana, which is cessation, and they have no more problems. And you can't say everything's wonderful because there isn't, but you know. Um, so a bodhisattva isn't interested in that. A bodhisattva understands that you can't be completely awakened until all beings are completely awakened. And so a bodhisattva's path is to help other people awake. And in fact, um, um, is it Thomas or J.C. Cleary, one of the Cleary brothers, they're these very prolific translators of Buddhist texts from the late mid 20th century. Um, they call bodhisattvas enlightening beings. So they're an enlightening being. They're not, it's not about their own enlightenment, it's about their enlightening other beings. So that's bodhisattva. Can bodhisattvas be other beings? So the Mahayana, uh, Zen comes out of the Mahayana, and the Mahayana texts get quite fantastical, and you have other beings, like you have the, the Nagas, which are people who have the, um, the, the, the sort of like mermen and mermaids. They have the body of a snake and the you know, torso and head of a human being, and they live under the water, and they protected the Prajnaparamita Sutras, until Nagarjuna dove down and, and they gave him to him. That's the story. Uh, anyway, so you have these fantastical beings. You have the, the, the night goddesses. You have all these amazing beings, you know. And uh, there, I think it's in the Avatamsaka Sutra where, um, no, it's the Lotus Sutra, I think, where uh, a Naga princess who's like seven years old or something attains enlightenment. Boom, like that. I believe uh, ortho, in the Orthodox literature, she had to turn into a male very quickly before she could <laughs> get to the final stage. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, so any kind of being can be a bodhisattva. What is the direction of their life? 
What is the clarity of their mind? How strong is their center? Are they awake? And they're in their being awake, their direction is to help. So yeah, so any being can be a bodhisattva. A snake can be a bodhisattva, right? Why not? Yeah, scorpion, why not? Scorpion bodhisattva. Dolphins? Yeah, dolphins, yeah. <laughs> they're so benign. They're easy to imagine as bodhisattvas. But yeah, so, but the most important thing is you can be a bodhisattva. That's the most important thing. Everybody on the screen, everybody in this room can not only can be a bodhisattva, but already intrinsically is a bodhisattva. You just have to let your inner bodhisattva out. Talk about self-actualization, you know? And you could, you could see this practice as being about letting your inner bodhisattva out. You can see it as being about that, you know? Overcoming your personal story that Todd spoke about so eloquently, the story of me. And really waking up, because when you wake up, what do you wake up to? You wake up not to, oh, this world is so beautiful and all these beings or celestial beings are blessing me. No, you wake up to the reality of the suffering in this world. And Lord knows there is a lot of suffering going on in this world. A lot of suffering. And people are using this suffering to make even more suffering because that's what happens. You know? So you wake up to that. You wake up to that, and then you become alert. What can I do? So practice is really important to give us that strong center, that open heart, that clear mind. So when we wake up to the suffering in this world, we can do something. Usually it's very small. But, you know, another wonderful thing about the Mahayana is because beings are not separate from each other, if you just do your job, you don't have to fix anything. You just do what is available to you. And if everybody does what's available to them, then because we are this great being, then together, together something happens. So, you know, in the monotheistic religions, they have this idea of the individual and that the individual, you know, is going to accomplish things on their own. But instead, it's really like the fingers of a hand. You know, they, I, I say this all the time, but it's like the fingers of a hand and they look like they're separate from each other, but they're not. So if the thumb does the thumb's job and the pinky does the pinky's job and every finger does its job, then together we wake up. So that's what it's about. And time is up. So thank you very much.